Welcome to our latest Hippocratic Adventures chat. I'm Dr. Ashwini Vipat, and today we are so excited to have Dr. Sarah Silva with us. Dr. Sarah Silva received her medical degree from Loma Linda University. She did her family medicine residency training in Boise, Idaho, and a one-year fellowship doing C-sections in Seattle. She's been practicing full-spectrum family medicine in rural Southern Chad since 2018 with her husband and their two small children. You can also find her blogging at For Healing of the Nations, and I'll make sure to share the link below as well. So before we get started, make sure to subscribe and then sit back and enjoy. Dr. Sarah Silva, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me today. Of course. So tell us your story. How did you end up practicing in Chad? So I started to do a few trips um, overseas when I was in high school. And then in college, I did a year teaching English um, in Africa. And at that point, I really enjoyed the year, but I thought, you know, I think that I want to do a career in working overseas, especially on the continent of Africa. So I saw that there was a huge need for um, better medical care on the continent of Africa. So with that in my head, I went forward with my medical training. And then I found um, Loma Linda University, which has a loan repayment program where they sponsor a certain percentage of my loans for every year that I serve overseas at one of the hospitals within this particular network of hospitals. So um, once I finished with my fellowship, um, then I found that there was a need in Chad, was located um, by one of the physicians who is currently working there, went over for a short visit and saw that there was a need and I could be a fit and then um, learned French for a few months, and then in beginning of 2018, launched to our hospital in Chad. Wow. Um, well, that's quite a journey. Um, can you actually, for, for the folks that are listening, can you describe where Chad is? Because it may not sure. be obvious. Right. I had never even heard of the country before I was called by our sending organization to come over here. So Chad is in the heart of Africa, in Central Africa. We're surrounded by um, several unstable nature uh, neighbors, but we happen to be fairly stable, just depending on um, what's currently going on in the capital city. So Chad is one of the <clears throat> poorest countries in the entire world. It always ends up on the top five in the world. Um, development index for being the least developed. The infant mortality rate before five years of age is 11%. Maternal mortality rate is a little over 1%. So it's a country that has um, an incredible amount of need for medical care. There's one medical school in the entire country and most physicians once they graduate are just sent straight to hospitals or clinics without any kind of further training. So that as well as um, the incredibly poor nature of the country means that the, the hospitals in country um, just have very few resources. And so when I knew that I wanted to serve in a place that had a need after finishing my medical training, um, I was not able to find a country, <laughs> hardly. <clears throat> that had greater need than here in Chad. And you said that the medical school you went to, they actually had a loan repayment program. Can you talk about that? Because um, I imagine that that's kind of news to a lot of people, including me. Yes. You know, it's the only one that I've been able to find like it's kind. Loma Linda University is in Southern California. Um, it's a Seventh-day Adventist institution. And so our um, umbrella organization is Adventist Health International, AHI. And it was started in the whole late 90s to try to revive some of the hospitals 
um, that our church had scattered throughout Africa, um, a few in um, Central America, and then a few in um, South America. So there's probably about 20 hospitals on the continent of Africa underneath this um, umbrella organization, AHI. So they started seeing that, you know, physicians graduate from medical school and by the time they're done with residency, like this incredible burden of financial debt is so huge that it, it prevents most physicians from being able to go out and do work in very low income um, countries. So the thought was, let's sponsor part of their loans every year that they're out so that these physicians don't have to worry at all about making loan payments. They can just focus on working in this underdeveloped country and not have to be contacted by the loan companies <laughs> during their time um, overseas. So it was a, just a great fit for me so that as soon as I finished residency and then just a one year fellowship, I was launched immediately out. Wow. I think that's incredible. I think that's incredible. And then you also mentioned that you learned some French. So in Chad, they speak French. Is that, um, are there other languages that they speak there? Or is that... Yes, the two um, main languages are French and then the Chadian version of Arabic. So Chad is also a really unique country in that it has a pretty harmonious relationship between Christians and Muslims. So it's the, the country is um, pretty relaxed and open to most people of most backgrounds coming to help, which really, really appreciate. So at our hospital, you know, myself, I've been there since 2018 working full time, but we have lots of physicians who come short term from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, whether that be faith or non-faith, um, because there's just such a huge need. So we really appreciate the ease of getting medical providers into the country for either short or long-term work. And so then is the medical care communicated in French or, yeah, what do you call Yeah. <laughs> so I haven't uh, learned um, Chadian Arabic very well yet. My husband is taking classes with our local imam. Um, but I've learned at least a few phrases to be able to communicate with patients. So mainly I communicate with our nurses in French and then the nurses will translate that to either the local dialects. There's over 200 local dialects spoken in Chad um, or they'll translate it into Chad and Arabic. So I try to learn a few token phrases in some of the main languages, but mainly I communicate in French, which I only learned right before coming to Chad. Wow, and so before you, uh... When did you, so are you pretty fluent in French then by now or? Now it's greatly improved. I had a few months training right before I launched, um, which was helpful, but I think I learned the most just being on the ground. And thankfully the French that's spoken in Africa tends to be the second language for most of, of the people who are speaking it. Um, so it's a, a bit simpler than the French that's spoken in France. Okay. Wow, <laughs> that's very cool. Um, and so when you work, now that you're working in Chad, are you able to work under a U.S. medical license or did you have to get licensed in Chad as well? Thankfully, it's very easy to get a Chadian medical license. So they, um, you know, I'm not sure about um, DOs or nurse practitioners or physician's assistants, but I know at least me being an MD, it was just a matter of sending the government um, my various diplomas from um, all walks of my educational journey. And once they had those documents, we pay 300 US dollars per year to continue to have a license. And um, I haven't ever had any trouble um, since that time. Then folks who come for short term, whether it's a couple of weeks or even a couple of months, usually do not need to have anything, um, any formal agreement with the government in order to practice medicine here. So the government tends to be quite hands off. Um, so that makes it just easier for us to be able to get folks in and out without problems. 
So I still do continue to keep um, my state licensing in the state that I practice residency at just for ease of getting back to the U.S. to practice. Um, And then I have done some work also for the Indian Health Service, and they were willing to take my license um, from my particular state to work in other states as well. So that's just been very easy for me to do short-term stints to work in the U.S. to keep up uh, my medical practice in a U.S. or more developed country setting as well. And so it sounds like you're, you've been in Chad in a full-time position for kind of a long-term placement. Um, and it sounds like there are short-term placements for folks that would be interested. Um, how short or how long do you typically expect people who may be interested in coming up to Chad and working with you or working with colleagues? Um, uh, like, what are the possibilities there in terms of time frames? Sure. I think the shortest amount we've ever had someone come was six days. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've also had people come for weeks, a month, a few months. So, you know, just the the possibilities are are there for anyone who's willing to come for any really amount of time. So our particular hospital is similar to a lot of the hospitals in Chad in terms of um, we have a medicine ward, um, pediatrics, and then uh, maternal fetal unit and surgery. So those are our four wards. Um, And we're staffed by, it just varies year to year. We have sometimes emergency physicians, sometimes only family physicians. Sometimes we have general surgeons. Other times we have surgical specialties who are able to just do our general surgery. So um, there's possibilities for a multitude of specialties for um, you know, primary care. There's certainly a need on our regular wards. In surgery, we always need general surgeons. In fact, our current general surgeon left for fellowship a few months ago. So we're really trying hard to get general surgeons to come, even just for one month stints to help us Um, to at least have one surgeon available for the uh, X labs that we inevitably have every week. Then for surgical specialists, we're um, always open to having um, specialty surgical like weeks. So we had a week of um, cleft lips and cleft palates just last month. So we made announcements on the radio. The plastic surgeon came over with his anesthesiologist and then they just did cleft lips and palates and um, many head and neck surgeries for a week. And so we're familiar with having groups come in with their operating team. Um, You know, we haven't had um, an ophthalmology team before. We've been interested in getting um, some ophthalmologists in to, for example, do cataract surgeries for our patients and um, there's lots of possibilities. We have incredible pathology. So it just takes a physician who is uh, flexible and willing to work in less than ideal conditions to be able to come here. So actually about that, can you tell us more about what your practice of family medicine in Chad is like and how it compares to the U.S., to, to a family medicine practice in the U.S.? Mm-hmm. Maybe the rural parts of the U.S. or the Indian Health Service, since you have some experience there. Sure. So Chad, um, like probably most of its neighbors, is not yet used to non-communicable diseases. So the great focus and the thought in everyone's head is that every disease is a communicable, infectious disease that can be treated for a few weeks and is better. So um, we are seeing more and more um, non-communicable diseases that we're struggling to get patients um, educated about the management of. So I do very little standard family medicine in terms of seeing patients in clinic. Um, we, The nature of the country is such that we don't um, take appointments. We give patients vague um, 
times to come back, but um, over half the country is illiterate and most people don't have watches. They don't know their birth dates. So time is very, um, is very different than what it is in the developed world. So I do mainly inpatient care. Um, I do inpatient medicine, uh, pediatrics, and then um, our OB ward as well. So the fellowship that I did in Seattle was to get training in C-sections. So I'll do all the complicated obstetrical cases. Um, I will usually call in the general surgeon um, for things like uterine ruptures that might require a hysterectomy. But otherwise, I'll do the DNCs and the rest of the obstetrical care. So my practice is vastly different from what it would be in the United States. And part of that is due to the fact that we have such limited resources as well at our hospital. We have a few standard labs uh, as far as infectious diseases, hepatitis and tuberculosis. We can check for those things. Um, and it's hit or miss if we're able to get um, for example, a comprehensive medical panel. Sometimes our machines are functional and sometimes they're not. So there are many times when I have patients with unclear diagnosis just because I don't have the lab testing um, or the imaging available. We have now a functional x-ray, which has been a wonderful addition to our hospital a few years ago. And then I have had to learn ultrasonography as well, which I've just learned on the field and then have been trying to get training from others and hope to get some CME in ultrasound training as well um, in the years to come. So we um, have those two imaging modalities, but with x-ray and ultrasound and a few labs, it still leaves a huge gap as far as um, other testing that could clue me into diagnosis. So it sounds like you actually have to practice with a lot more degree of uncertainty than you probably would have in the U.S. if you if it's hard to even sometimes get a comprehensive comprehensive metabolic panel, or it sounds like even the X-ray was a recent um, addition. Yes, definitely, and I have to go off of my physical exam a lot, so it's taken me back to medical school and just really trying to hone in on any physical exam findings that I can to be able to clue me into the diagnosis. Okay. So it, and it, it, it tends to be very um, frustrating to not always know what's going on with the patient, but also extremely rewarding because we have patients who come from far and wide to our hospital because they've learned that we tend to care a little bit more about their well-being and are, are um, just very interested in, in their um, well-being and their health um, and tend to take a little bit more time with their patients too. And how are you compensated for, for your work there? Sure. So I get a living stipend um, for being in Chad from my sending organization, Adventist Health International. The folks who come for short-term trips usually are all self-funded. We have had some who would go to the developed world for a couple of months, you know, earn the funds they needed to use to come over here to work since living costs are extremely minimal. Um, the hardest part is just getting here, but once they're here, cost of living um, isn't, you know, something that, that is significant so but thankfully the living stipend as well as travel compensation um, and loan repayment is makes it so that we live quite comfortably for and, chatty and standards <laughs> and you're actually in chad with i think you mentioned your husband and two kids yes so you, they, all of you moved in 2018 then so I actually met my husband in France. He was studying as well at the same institution. And I was telling him that I was going to Chad and, and then 
he was the only person crazy enough to be willing to come with me. So he came and found that he could also love me in Chad and not just in France. And then we were married um, later that year and have successively have had our children after that point. Um, the work in Chad tends to be a, of a 24 seven nature. So I split the work with the other physicians, but usually we're always all on call. So that um, has both its good and bad aspects. Um, the good side is that my work hours are a little bit more flexible. So it makes it easier to get home and um, breastfeed a, a newborn. But it does mean that if I, I make up for it during the middle of the night when I'm called in for a postpartum hemorrhage at 3 a.m. So um, it, it has its benefits, certainly, um, for being a, a place to raise a family. We're in a pretty rural setting, so life is simple. The kids play a lot outdoors. They have other little friends that they can play with. Um, you know, life is just very, very simple. But it's a great atmosphere for kids to be able to grow up in, to be free range outside. Absolutely. And um, when you're at work, who's taking care of the kids then? So that's usually my husband. We do have another missionary family who will also take care of the kids some as well. And then I try to jet home here and there to cook a meal or put a child down for a nap. So the hospital um, housing is just right next to where the actual wards are. So we have a little bit of space in between, but I can be there in two minutes. Okay. So it's all just on the, the same compound, um, making it easy to get back and forth. And your colleagues that you work with at, at the hospital, are they uh, also from the US or are they from other places? Yes, right now we just have US trained physicians. We send um, Chadians off to medical school and then have them come back to our hospital so we can give them some additional training and then we send them out to our other institutions. There's two other hospitals that are within our network in country. So we really see ourselves as a teaching institution. We want to train up the uh, local Chadians to be able to function and, and manage their hospitals as well. So the hospital um, financial and administrative is all Chadians. The doctors are um, usually a mix between US trained and Chadian trained. Right now, we have a few more um, US trained <clears throat> physicians as we're waiting for the next wave of, of Chadian graduates to come through. Okay, got it. And how does malpractice insurance work in Chad? So there actually isn't any malpractice insurance. I, <laughs> oh, I don't. I think maybe one time, one physician was sued for something, um, but the case was dropped. So there isn't any malpractice. Again, half of our patients are illiterate. So thankfully it isn't really an, an issue at all. I've never been called into question, never, um, never had to do anything legal since I've been here. So that, has been a huge benefit, especially with the amount of obstetrics that I do. And uh, unfortunately, we tend to only get in the hospital the complications that have failed to deliver at clinics or at, at home. So we we see a lot of uh, a lot of suffering, but also a lot of opportunity for really helping in a country where women and children are are undermined greatly. Yeah. What were some of the challenges that you encountered in transitioning to Chad? So it certainly was hard for me to switch from a U.S. trained mindset of I want to get everything necessary to try to save this patient because the since there's no um, widely used insurance company in Chad, the patient's families pay themselves for every test that I buy, every medicine that I get. So each clinical decision that I make is weighed in the balance. It's not as simple for me to just 
order all the tests that I think are necessary to find the diagnosis for this patient, I have to really think, do I have a high probability of this test changing my management of this patient? So that has helped. Um, I feel like it's helped my medical um, practice and medical knowledge in that it's just given me a lot of cause to reflect on um, differential diagnosis and the outcome and, and medical management based on the diagnostics that I order. Um, it's also been extremely hard for me to accept um, loss of patients. So we, since you know, going back to what I said about us having few lab tests and diagnostic imaging compared to the states, there's many times when I don't know what's wrong with the patient and I try all of the treatments <clears throat> that we have available. Sometimes I know there are treatments that would save the patient, but we don't have. And sometimes I don't know what the patient has and I just don't have the diagnostics to figure it out. So so oh, that has also been a challenge for me to get used to as well, just acceptance of where I'm living and what I'm able to do with what I have. Um, so I think the hardest is losing mothers. We often lose children. As I said, the, the infant mortality rate is, well, the under five mortality rate is 11%. Um, so most families have lost a child, um, especially due to things like malaria or typhoid. Um, but losing mothers, I think, is probably the hardest for me with or without the child. Sometimes the two are, are together because they come literally almost dead by the time they make it to the hospital. Our hospital is off the paved road system. This area of Chad is very rural. So Patients come in on motorcycles, on ox carts, on um, donkeys. They come in at, at the very end a lot of times. So that acceptance um, continues to be a struggle for me at times as well. Yeah, and so how do you cope with that? Because I think I could imagine one of the frustrating parts is knowing that if you had had the right tools, this person could have probably still been alive. You could have uh, helped them in that way. Um, how do you kind of make sense of that? Because I have a feeling you probably deal with it at least on a weekly, monthly basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. I think um, I've just realized that if I internalize the loss too much and make myself to the point of being non-functional, then the dozens or maybe even hundreds of patients that I could have helped if I had been able to let go or just keep plugging on, um, I think that that continues to help me to realize like, even though I did my best um, and it wasn't enough to be able to save them with what I had, at least I was able to show the family that we tried everything we could. Um, and if I let it get to me too much, then I'll miss out on helping all the other people that I could actually help to make better. Yeah, absolutely. And so what have been some of the joys in your four years now, actually, in Chad? Yes. You know, I think um, there's just an incredible amount of satisfaction that comes from helping those who are so destitute. Um, you know, we, we just see the absolute poorest of the poor here where we are. And as frustrated as we get sometimes with the patients or their families for um, coming in too late or not, not being able to put all their financial resources towards saving their loved one or, or taking their loved one home too early, I think that those ones that were able to help um, and the, 
the thankfulness that they have for that um, just really helps us to keep going. So, you know, I enjoy practicing medicine in the States as well, but the ratio of physicians to patients is so minuscule here compared to what it is in the States. And just knowing that it, the little that I can give makes a difference here, an incredible difference, because if I wasn't here, it's possible that this patient might have died. Um, that That is incredibly rewarding. All right, so the last section, we're gonna ask, uh, ask some uh, really quick rapid fire questions. Um, basically, which are meant to do short, kind of off the top answers, and, and this is fun. So, the first question is, what's a cool place you visited after moving to China? So, probably our most memorable was down south. Um, I'm a mountain girl. Chad is flat in the area where we are. So, we found a spot that had a mountain. Um, so we took motorcycles an hour and a half to one town. Then we took um, a broken down Toyota Corolla taxi two hours to where the paved road ends. And then a motorcycle half an hour to the river and then a canoe um, ferry across the river and then another taxi to the base of the mountain. We spent several hours on this like 1000 foot mountain just being away from people breathing some fresh air in the trees and then did it all in reverse. And one of those um, Toyota rides in the taxi coming back happened to be the last taxi because it was evening. We saw the taxi, there were already two people in the front and five people in the back mm -hmm. of the taxi. And so we said, oh, you are too full, keep on going. And the driver said, look lady, we're the last taxi tonight. If you don't want to spend the night here by the side of the road, <laughs> you're going to for my taxi. We also had our large German Shepherd with us at the time too. So my husband and I joined the passenger in the front seat and all nine of us, including the full-size German Shepherd, took the Toyota taxi for two hours to get to our destination back home. That's awesome. That's an awesome story. Um, the next question is, what's a piece of advice you would give to someone who's on the fence about trying out an experience abroad? Um, taste and see, just try it. Like contact that organization, buy that ticket, experience it. And then that's the only way you'll ever know. Like try it out just, even if it's for a couple days, a couple weeks, just try. Just try, that's, that's good advice. And for you, and actually now your family, because your family, it, it was the two of you that moved, and now you've doubled. Um, has this relocation and move been worth it for you? Certainly. We've had incredible struggles just getting used to the culture, the climate, um, the lack of all of the comfortable, pleasurable things that we are habituated to in the U.S., um, but the reward of of waking every day knowing I'm going to make a difference in at least a couple dozen lives today by me just being here and giving medical care, that has been incredibly sweet. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Dr. Sarah Silva, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was really a pleasure to chat with you. And with that, we wrap up another episode of Discovering Where Your White Coat Can Take You. Now, we want to hear from you. What was your biggest insight, aha, or takeaway from this conversation? Let us know in the comments below. And of course, don't forget to become a Hippocratic Adventures Insider. Sign up for our newsletter and be in the know about everything related to practicing medicine abroad. Sign up at HippocraticAdventures.com forward slash subscribe.